podcast. This episode is focused on grad school, and with us we have special guest um, UTM math professor Mike Polyuk, as well as um, Ash, Mahika, and Kyo, who are all currently uh, grad students. Uh, I guess we could start with introductions. Um, let's see, we'll start with uh, Ash, because that's the order that you are on in the stream. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Aishwarya. You can call me Ash. Uh, I'm currently a master's thesis student at the University of Waterloo uh, in computer science, and I'm specifically working on automated program verification. Okay. Um, hi. My name is Gil. I'm also a master's thesis student in University of Toronto, and my field is in um, systems. Hi, everyone. My name is Mahika. I just graduated from UTM in a double major in computer science and CCIT, and I currently started my PhD in computer science at Cornell University. Nice. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Mike Polyuk. Um, I am faculty at UTM. Uh, I'm a math prof, uh, and I've been at UTM for two years. Prior to that, I was a postdoc at the University of Calgary. And then prior to that, I did my um, master's and PhD at uh, U of T St. George. Um, okay, awesome. So we've got another awesome episode with a ton of awesome guests that are going to provide insight on uh, graduate school. So um, a little tradition that we have uh, between episodes is that the guests of the previous episode will ask a question for the guests of the next episode. Um, last episode, we had a podcast focused on women in STEM with uh, guest uh, Professor Shadia Sharman. And uh, the question that she had for you, Mike, was, uh, as a graduate student, how do you balance your work and social life, which is relevant because she's finishing up her um, uh, PhD, I believe. And for the students, um, why did you want to go into grad school? So I guess we could start with Mike. Okay, so this is uh, this is really hard because the the first year that I started was I did not balance things at all, um, and would like have super late nights and stuff. So when uh, in my first year, the the strategy was I cut out a block of time for myself, which was Sunday evenings, and I promised myself that Sunday from six p.m. to end of the night, I I could do whatever I want, read whatever. Uh, so long as it wasn't math homework. Um, and that helped quite a bit. Uh, and then once things started to calm down, um, I think for me, it was a matter of making, like, sort of building in, um, just hanging out with friends, but socializing, going to do things that I want to do that isn't just grad school. Um, yeah, so, so building those in and, and um, making sure that I identify the things that I want to do and prioritize them. Awesome. Um, it's glad to hear that, uh, you know, despite all the workload from grad school, you're still able to maintain a social life. Um, okay, so and now for the grad students, uh, why did you guys want to go into grad school? I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, uh, so with, I, I guess I did a PY at UTM and I just realized through that, even though I learned a lot, just software engineering wasn't my my favorite thing in the world. And I always was like more curious to sort of do research in other aspects or like be more creative, I guess. And I didn't like having these, um, I don't know, writing uh, programming tasks and stuff like that. And even though I am doing programming as a grad student, I I was just like, seeking something something else and I was already an RA with another lab at U of T and I saw myself driven towards that kind of work more and I was like grad school is, is the way <laughs> so that's how it came about and um, I'm, I'm glad I did it but yeah I, I think I can agree with my what Mahika just said another thing was that um Going into industry, I feel like I can kind of do even later down the road. Um, but right now, I am still interested in 
uh, my specific field and I wanted to learn more in it rather than just go into industry now and start working. I guess my answer is pretty similar. Um, I, I guess like the studious answer is I wanted to keep learning. The non-studious answer is I wanted to delay adulting. That's where I find the balance, I feel. Okay. Um, with that being said, hopefully anyone in the chat that is looking to go into grad school can find some um, inspiration for their reasons of going into it. Um, I guess something that we should probably get out of the way for our viewers that don't know a lot about grad school is um, just a basic overview of what a MSc is versus a um, applied master's versus a direct entry PhD. So if anyone has any insight as to what those are, uh, please lend your thoughts. Um, so I think the whole notion of master's is more Canadian thing than um, because if I remember correctly, I think U.S. is more just uh, direct entry to PhD. I think Mahika can put more insight to that. So when I was looking at um, master's program, because that's usually what we hear after an undergrad, you go to your master's. All the master's program in the States were professional masters, and they required at least like 50K of tuition per year. And I was like, no, no, not about that life. So if I want to do research, the option was to apply for a direct PhD. But Canada has research-based masters, so that's that's nice. Right. So I think U of T offers um, two type of, types of master's program. One's called MSc, which is the thesis-based uh, one you do research with. And there's also MSC AC, which is the applied industrial professional um, master's that I guess US also provides. In the math department, we have uh, two, uh, we also have two uh, PhD, uh, masters. One of them is a thesis based one again, and the other one is just course based. So you can complete it um, without doing a thesis, and something like 95% of people take the course based one. In, in math. Okay, um, very well said. Uh, I hope that provides some insight to anyone in the chat who didn't know about all of the paths that they could take after undergrad. Um, we've got a question from the chat from Orange Navy. Uh, do you think it's too difficult to be working in industry and learning at the same time? Depends. Do you want to have a social life? I, because I think half of the, I mean, I, I'm just getting into um, my master, so I wouldn't really know, but I think half of the kind of master's experience is getting to know other master's students and talking to them, quite similar to how undergrad is. So... If you, I feel like if you would, if you want to neglect that part, you would have some time for industry, but I don't know if you would want to do that either. Yeah, I completely agree. I think um, doing a master's or research or just studying beyond is a investment of time and mental energy, and you should focus fully on one thing if you're if you're doing that. That being said, it's definitely possible to juggle a few things at once. Um, but doing one at a time and putting all your energy and efforts into that is going to be appreciated by like your colleagues, your research teammates, or just even people at work. I know there's It'll, also the option. Oh, no, go ahead. I think it also depends on like how, what your strengths are coming into it. So for me, going into my master's, I was like weak relative to the other students. So I needed to spend a lot more time on the learning aspects. And um, I had to devote that energy to get up to speed. And at the end of my master's, I was, I was at the same level. I was up to speed. But during my master's, I would not, not have had enough time to do other things. Sorry, Ash, you can go ahead. 
I don't know, I was just going to say that there's also the option of doing a, a part-time master's, I know. So I think some people who actually have jobs also opt for that because it kind of gives you that um, leeway to be doing a job as well as learning. Okay, uh, thanks for that. So Orange, if you're in the chat still, um, I guess our guests have come to a consensus that they would not advise it um, and um, maybe look into a part-time master's if you want to do that. So thank you guys for that. Um, let's see here. Uh, how do I, how would someone know if uh, grad school is right for them? What are the um, indications that they should go into grad school? I think you mentioned something similar, Mike, where you said you did it to get up to speed. Yeah. So, um, the, the biggest advice that I've heard about, um, going to grad school, especially uh, from, from the perspective of, of math, um, especially, is that you should only do a grad school if you like really feel compelled to do it. Um, a lot of the math you need to do um, sort of anything really um, sort of ends around your third year of your undergrad. And then everything else you're learning is more like theoretical. It's, it's sort of more esoteric. So uh, you should really go to grad school if that's the thing you want to do. Um, for example, if you're if you're concerned with like making money or something, then you're going to set yourself back a year or five years or whatever. Um, and the things you're going to learn aren't necessarily needed for uh, what you're going to apply. Um, this is from the perspe perspective of math, though. So if you're if you're doing um, uh, CS, it might be different. I think it's um, but very you, much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just gonna say that, that, that all that being said, you don't um, like if if you think that grad school is for you, you should go for it. Like, um, don't don't let other people tell you um, that it's not for you. If if it feels right for you, um, then you should go for it. Like when we talk about grad school, do we mean like research in grad school or like doing an MSCAC? for example, which is like applied. We're talking about research? I guess both. Um, yeah, I guess there's like a inquisition yeah. or curiosity for knowledge in both of them. Like if you really, really have that and you want to continue learning or and not learning, then like contributing to your field or innovating something, or then there's like other paths that you can take. Yeah, um, I also had the same question, you know, while in my fourth year, um, trying to decide what I wanted to do. And I did ask around, it, especially within the CS department. I, and I think the answer was pretty similar to what Mike have just said. It's financially not a best idea. Like you can get a very stable job with a great income even just out of undergrad. So if you wanted to go into master's, perhaps for the financial reason, then probably not a greatest idea. I think, um, especially for research, you would definitely, you would need to be super interested in that specific field to actually stick with it. But also that being said, um, research master's does not last too long, I think. The minimum duration for U of T at least is like 17 months. And I think it lasts as long as, as far as like two, three years. So it's not, it, even if you don't like it, it's not a complete, you know, it's not going to take half a decade for you to complete anyways. Are you saying is, something about the PhD program, I mean? <laughs> No, no, no. I, well, I mean, if you are already iffy, you know, Maybe that would be yeah, a reason to sure. not go into direct entry. <laughs> I'm joking. But, I'm joking. Yeah. but yeah, that was like definitely a commitment because when, when I got my offer letter, it said that it's like a six year plan. And that's that's when you really have to think, like, are you willing to put in that effort and have all your friends and classmates go on to wonderful software engineering jobs and buy homes and you're still studying or something like that. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, like get homes or start families or whatever. Like six years is a long time from uh, an undergrad, and it's like you're not a you're not a teenager anymore. You're you're like a, a full fledged adult. 
Okay. Um, continuing on, I hope that answered your uh, question uh, in the chat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what GPA is required for grad school? Um, I can answer for U of T CS at very least, but um, it depends on whether you want to go into professional versus um, so MSC AC versus a uh, research base, which is MSC. For the research base, they look more into your um, experience in research rather than your GPA. They do have a minimum requirement, but it's not very high. Um, and I think they only look at your last year as well. So knowing the profs at U of T and kind of having the research experience would easily overweigh your GPA. But that doesn't go, I, I think for a professional, it differs a lot. I think that does require you to have high GPA and whatnot. Yeah, e echoing exactly what, what you said, uh, we, we typically um, don't care so much about a super high GPA, um, and especially that we don't emphasize the, the whole like four-year undergrad or whatever. We care mostly about the last two years, what's your trajectory. So for example, if you failed a first-year calculus course, we don't really care that much, um, but we do want to see that you've since taken harder courses and have succeeded in them. For sure. I think, um, and then when applying to a direct PhD program, uh, when I talk to professors one-on-one, -on -one, they say they don't care about GPA at all. So I don't think your advisor or professors really care about that. It's something that the admissions committee uses to just filter out uh, applicants, if they're getting like 5,000 applications, they probably just filter by GPA and superficial ways as such. But also for international um, applicants or applying to other countries, you need to do the GRE and those scores so it can sometimes outweigh a low GPA if you do really well on that. So. Yeah, and to reiterate the uh, thesis program, um, definitely recommend like talking to professors and stuff before you apply just because that's generally what decides what if you whether or not you get in rather than gpa so like knowing a professor knowing that them knowing that you're interested in their research and seeing you as kind of like more of a colleague rather than like a student is always good for thesis programs okay awesome um i think a lot of people in the chat will be happy to hear that um you know a bad first year doesn't really uh, bar them from going into grad school should they choose to do it. So I mean, it was pretty interesting that uh, I guess Keo mentioned that the applied master's has a high GPA threshold, whereas uh, compared to the research one, it doesn't really. So I, I initially thought it would be the opposite. Uh, cool. Let's see. Uh, moving on. Uh, what is the best way to get ready for grad school as an undergrad? Uh, get to know people and get to know your subject. So learn stuff. Um, basically, learn anything you can. Um, if it's if it's exciting to you, um, do it because um, you'll you, like you need to know some basic stuff about your program that you're going into. But really, the thing that's going to set you apart is your ability to learn things quickly. So like um, find something that interests you. Find something that you're passionate about and learn it um, and get used to like playing around with it and trying new things. Um, and uh, that will help you quite a bit. And then the second one is to do research as, as quickly as you as, as early as you can. Um, get to know people, talk to them, say, hey, I'm interested in some stuff. Do you want to work on some fun problems together? Um, do you want to work on some hard problems together? Uh, it doesn't even matter if you make progress, but just the experience of, of doing research early will help you quite a bit. Yeah, adding on to what Mike said, um, I know a lot of it is finding, you know, what subject you're really interested in and finding the supervisor that you are willing to work with. But uh, fact of the matter is some applications you require, um, I think, usually three reference letters. 
So being able to have multiple people to kind of ask and uh, ask for the reference letter is also super important. I kind of got lucky in that regards, and well, since I was able to TA a couple courses, but um, generally speaking, you wouldn't want to ask a professor uh, to write your reference letter just because you took their course, right? Everyone takes their course. Um, what? So you have to really be able to work with them, and uh, they have to really be able to write um, write what's so great about you, right? So being able to have multiple research experience under your belt is also important because of that, in my opinion. Yeah, as an undergrad, I remember talking to students and everyone just being like, okay, everyone tells me to get started on research, but I don't really know how, and I don't even know what research is. And that's that's a very true and real problem, but it just starts with curiosity and interest. So if you take a course and that you sort of liked um, at the end of the course, you can always email the professor or go talk to them and say that you're interested in the subject. Do you have any ongoing projects? Can we set up a meeting and talk about some things happening in this domain right now that I can start taking a look at? And usually they would introduce you to some problems in the field right now and some areas of interest that you can maybe start a research project. And all of my undergrad research projects were just stemmed out of that those conversations. And I ended up being a research assistant at several labs. And once you get to know one or two professors, it sort of snowballs where your interest gets deeper and deeper. And then they're like, oh, you should talk to this faculty here. And then you get referred. And that's how you also just build up your network while being an undergrad. And just always be sincere and show curiosity, show interest. And um, that's that's the best way to prepare. And also get into one field, even if you're not sure 100% if that's what you want to do for the rest of your life, but pick something in CS that you find a little bit interesting and get deeper into it. Um, rather than sort of being the jack of all trades, you really need to go in deep, deeper into one subject. So that would also be something you could do in undergrad, and that would be just taking a lot of different courses that you're interested in. And it can even start with a course that you're taking, like say either you're doing really well in the course and want to learn more, or you actually need help in the course, and maybe that means going to office hours and talking to the professor. Because it's all, like like Micah said, it's all about expressing that interest in what they're doing, and that's what gets that conversation going. Awesome. Um, so I guess just to summarize for everyone, uh, everyone um, in the podcast is really stressing that you should grow your network by seeking out opportunities that um, interest you and uh, definitely reach out to profs. Don't uh, don't be afraid of um, rejection and all that. Uh, uh, this is going to be There's our also, sorry. Uh, sorry. No, um, one thing I'd mention, I think UFT also has reading groups that you could join as an undergrad. Uh, I know there's a UTM CS education reading group happening, but uh, in whatever area that you're interested in, if you look up the faculty pages on UFT's website, they probably are part of some reading group if you do some enough stalking and looking around at their web pages. And uh, you could email them to say you want to be a part of the reading group, and then you meet weekly and you go through papers. And initially, it's fine if you're just in these groups not talking and just being a bit overwhelmed and absorbing everything. But attending these on a weekly basis will be a one way to get your foot in the door and understand what's happening in that field. So I know like um, machine learning also was starting a reading group last semester and they meet on a weekly basis, for example, so stuff like that. Yeah, should, I should also, oh, sorry, go, go for it. I should point out that like as a faculty, um, we have a different perspective than undergrads um, because undergrads, I think, um, are, are often afraid of approaching us. And saying like, oh, well, I don't know very much, and like, I don't know how to participate. But we know this; it's it's our job to help you, like, connect you with um, these opportunities. So you can totally just cold call us, just email us out of the blue, and say, I'm interested. Like, I don't know where to start, but here's my first email. And we love that. Like, imagine if someone um, emailed you and said, Hey, this thing that you've devoted your life to, I'm interested in it too. Can you tell me about it? So, like, like you'll often get a very positive response. And the worst case scenario is they say, 
no, our lab is full or, or some, or we don't have, like, I, I don't have the time for it, but that's okay. You just move on. Okay, guys, you, uh, you heard it straight from uh, a professor himself. Uh, shoot your shot. They, they would definitely love to uh, talk to you and have a conversation about that. Um, so this is going to be our last question before we transition into the second part of the podcast in which we're going to talk about uh, the research and work of what grad school entails. Uh, but that being said, uh, this last question is, how does funding work as a grad student? What's the uh, financial situation regarding that? So I guess I can answer. Yeah, okay. uh, so, so broadly, in broad strokes, um, there's two sources of funding. Either you'll get funding from um, like NSERC usually, which is the Canadian government um, uh, research, um, like science research council. So you might get money from them if you apply for a grant. Uh, and if you don't, um, the U of T offers a certain amount of funding, um, which is guaranteed to you. Uh, some of it is just a stipend. They just give it to you for doing research. And some of it is uh, for like doing TA work and things like this. Yeah, and it's different for everyone. I think they usually tell you that on your offer letter. And then according to that, it's it can change, go up and down, that kind of thing. It's always good to, it's very different, but like uh, essentially it's like stipend and TA usually waived for grad students doing research so the university will pay for that so you don't have to worry about tuition and you usually get an academic stipend from the university in return you have to do research for them or teach i should probably add that um i think most of the answers are um is for the research thesis based masters but for professional i think it's slightly different um i think you do have to pay for the actual course load and whatnot since you're not uh, technically doing research for them and but i think yeah. the, the applied computing masters has like an eight month internship as part of it right right which i think would cover the cost of tuition <laughs> i don't yeah right but that's not going to come right away and the initial tuition you would have to pay for it for sure or or grab um osap as you did in undergrad but for thesis based uh definitely they do give you research assistantship and also ta ship to help you cover it up and if that's not enough which for cs i think is enough um but if it's not enough you, you can apply for multiple scho uh, scholarships and whatnot Okay, uh, with that being said, I hope that uh, everyone's able to figure out their financials uh, going into grad school. Um, so now, going into part two, um, what uh, research studies have you done in the past that uh, you're most proud of? I guess I can start. Um, so I did... While I was at UTM, I worked with Daniel Singaro, Larry Zhang, and another student. And we looked at why students find it difficult to learn dynamic programming. So for those of you who have taken 373, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and that ended up getting submitted to a computer science education conference. And we presented there, which was a lot of fun. And I think that was pretty cool. Uh, I haven't done any publications as of yet in my master's, so that's probably the thing I'm most proud of, as it is the only thing I've published. <laughs> I think the longest running research that I've been part of, which is still ongoing, I think it will be published soon, is related to um, helping file system applications to be more universal. Uh, because right now, what what's going on with current file system for Linux operating system is that for every file system, you need its own proprietary tool. And that's no fun for everyone. Um, the developers need to kind of recreate the same thing over and over again. So we're trying to come up with some kind of interface to help with that. And 
I think I really enjoyed um, working with this because of how much in-depth knowledge you it's required within the Linux um, kind of source code. I, I hope uh, people can understand what I'm talking about since it's kind of a 369 and beyond type of thing, but yeah. It's really cool. Um, for me during undergrad, I took part in lots of different research projects, which is kind of a red flag too, because I was just jumping around like I did some humanities research as well. And uh, my main research is in human computer interaction. So uh, different ways that humans interact with computers which is self-explanatory. But um, a research project that I'm working on right now that I really, really like, and it's with uh, someone at U of T, it's uh, using smartphone sensors to detect and predict whether someone has depression and anxiety. So it has to do with mental health and data science, as well as a little bit of machine learning. And I'm working with two professors, one's in the Faculty of Information in downtown and one's in the Faculty of Computer Science in downtown. So it's a nice set. And we recently got a COVID research grant to do this research because this is something that people are experiencing during quarantine. So I think that's been really meaningful and nice. And we hope to publish a paper about that next year. So fingers crossed. <laughs> That's, uh, that's really cool, uh, Mika. Um, it reminds me of the ethics course I'm about to teach in the fall, because we're gonna use examples like that of um, like the, that, that sort of project is, is beneficial, it's good. Um, you have to use it for the right reasons. Um, so so sure. if you're interested yeah. in that, take mm. that course. <laughs> <laughs> we had a hard time passing ethics approval for it. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, so for me, um, my most uh, my most beloved uh, research project um, starts in my the story of it starts in my my PhD. So before I had decided on a thesis, um, I went to a conference that was interesting to me. Uh, I met someone there randomly who was like, "Hey, you want to work on this project together?" We did. Uh, that became my thesis, and then um, later on, um, at, once my PhD was finished, I was invited to a research workshop that was four months long in Prague. And I was just surrounded by experts uh, and people teaching us all the stuff they know for four months. And so as a group of maybe nine of us, we, we read through a pretty hard paper that was very challenging and um, we all had to work hard to understand. And we were all experts in a different thing. So we all added our own little thing to it. And we ended up writing an, a really nice paper, um, the nine of us, even though like on our own individually, none of us would have been able to do it. Um, so it felt really good to, to get these really robust, interesting results from uh, as a group. OK, awesome. Um, it was really interesting to hear all of these uh, studies that you guys are involved in. Uh, I think I can say that uh, the chat also loved that uh, discussion. Uh, so this seems to have blown up after that. So uh, let's get into the next question, which is um, what are some topics you would like to research in the future? So what I'm working on right now is uh, applying programming by example to one of the specific model checkers that our group is using. Um, and I was talking to, so programming by example, there's a group at Microsoft called uh, Pros Research Group, uh, where they've kind of built this engine that works with a lot of different pro programming by example things. So basically programming by example, as the name kind of suggests, is that you're kind of given like an, a couple of inputs and uh, corresponding outputs, and to be able to synthesize a program that gives takes those inputs and gives you the corresponding outputs from that. Um, which is actually pretty interesting, I think. Um, and there's a lot of different applications. So like some of the applications that I've heard are um, using it to kind of auto suggest changes when someone is actually programming. Um, so like say someone's going in to update a specific function in some code base, uh, if they update in one place, then becomes a suggestion for like the next place that it seems relevant. 
Um, and another idea that uh, has to do with education, which I thought was interesting, was to use that same kind of programming by example idea where you know what the output is and being able to clue students that are trying to solve the exact same problem, but they don't know what the output is, obviously, because they're trying to solve it and using that to kind of help them understand what they're trying to figure out, which I thought was cool. So I'd love to kind of explore that realm a little more. Right now I'm working on something very, very specific um, and won't have a lot of applications outside of our example, um, but I think it'd be cool to explore it further. Um, I'm The research project that I'm most interested in right now that I kind of uh, want to work on is related to persistent memory, which is essentially RAM on your computer that can keep the data um, upon rebooting. And it's kind of a new uh, technology that hasn't been fully explored yet. So um, there are a lot of papers right now that are trying to um, figure out what we can really do with it. And I think it will be really interesting to see what um, I can kind of come up with that kind of technology as well. Sound uh, really interesting. Um, when you apply for grad school, you have to write a statement of purpose. And in that statement of purpose, I initially listed like what I want to do research in, and I'm supposed to be very ambitious as well. Um, but my main research focus, I guess, going into my PhD is in human computer interaction and accessibility, um, where I'm interested in doing research for special needs populations. And one uh, thing that I recently found out that I can see myself doing in the future is this new technology of mid-air haptics. And not sure if you've heard of it. I hadn't heard of it a few months ago, but haptics technology is like basically phone vibration. That's, that's what we know haptics as when our phone vibrates when we get a message. But mid-air haptics is caused by um, ultrasonic waves. So there's a mid-air haptics device, and you can basically feel things in mid-air because these waves are sent out. And because of those vibrations, you could feel physical objects in mid-air. And I was thinking that that would be so cool and so interesting to use that for uh, doing research for people with uh, vision impairment or low vision and seeing how they can better understand the world and understand their surroundings uh, with mid-air haptics technology. But again, that's like very specific too. So, but mainly focusing on accessibility and using ubiquitous computing, IoT, and every sort of thing that I can to facilitate uh, better work for those populations. That sounds super cool. Uh... So my project is a lot more down to earth in a sense. Um, so the next research project I really want to do is I want to sort of redo uh, Math 102, the Intro to Proofs course. And my big idea is to make a skill tree for the course. So at the beginning of the course, I give you this like huge tree and I, for each point, tell you like, here's a skill that you'll need to learn. Like the basic skills are near the center and then the more advanced skills are on the outside. And if you want to get to those outside ones, it sort of shows you exactly what you need to do. You sort of do five problems in, in this area and then you've sort of mastered a simple thing and then you can go on to the more advanced skill. And, and in this way, I think it would give people a lot more um, sort of self-guidance and power in deciding like how they're going to learn the course. Um, because math especially is very, and, and computer science, it, it builds on itself quite a bit. And like we know as people who have gone through it that you need to know all of the basics and it builds on itself. Whereas I think beginning learners often think like, okay, I'll just skip this part, it won't be that important, and I'll just flub it on the exam or whatever. Um, but that's the recipe for failure. <laughs> so that's my big research project is I wanna redo it and um, uh, build it in a way that's more like student focused. Awesome. Um, people in the chat really loved all of these uh, research ideas. So I really hope that you guys get to uh, uh, explore them in the future and hopefully eventually read a paper about them. So if that happens, please let us know. I'm sure uh, everyone would love to 
read those. Um, I guess for Mike, let's see. In the chat, uh, Ken says, Hi, Mike, it's me, your favorite student. Miriam says hi, too. Hey. <laughs> hey, Miriam. And um, it, with regards to your map idea, um, there seems to be some excitement around that. Uh, Falofi says D&D, Matt 102, smiley face. <laughs> I, I was thinking of like Diablo 2 or like Path to Exile or something um, where you have these, like you put in these gems or whatever and it, and it sort of builds its way out. Um, that's what I'm thinking. I'm sure that would uh, score very well with anyone who plays video games in your chat. Yeah. <laughs> in your class. I, I see. Men of culture as well. <laughs> Path of Exile is a great game. I, I don't play it. Um, my brother plays it, uh, but yeah. I, want, I, I wanted to. So, um, But that's the most recent game I can, I can reference. <laughs> giving myself away. OK. Um, next up, uh, we, I guess for the chat, I, it would be informational to learn about how the process of research is done from start to finish. So uh, if you could provide some of your experiences regarding uh, you know, the deciding what to research, uh, actually conducting that research, writing the paper uh, to getting published, uh, that would be very helpful. So, so maybe I'll start since I have the most research experience. Um, it all starts with uh, just being interested in stuff. So you, the more curious you are, the more interested, the more you'll start to learn interesting problems. And most researchers have like five or six problems on the go at any given time. Um, not, the, not the like active research projects, sort of things percolating in the background that they're interested in and things they're reading about. And when you learn new things, you can connect it to some of the problems you're thinking about. So that's, that's where it often starts. And then the actual research time can take like years of just talking to people, coming back to things, learning new things, coming back to it. Um, once you, if you're lucky enough to solve a problem, then you write it up. And that's sort of the most horrible part uh, because you're already tired of the problem at that point. And so you have to just like write it out. And we've all read crappy papers and you don't want to be that person, but you're already so sick of the problem that you just want to get it on the paper. And then you go through this long process of like sending it to a publication, and it takes sometimes upwards of a year, two years to get back, to hear back from the reviewers. And then eventually, like a long time after you've finished the problem, it gets published, and uh, you've since moved on to other things. I can confirm, yeah. that's pretty much what it's like. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a kind of a funny story about that. Um, most of the research I've done are kind of helping a PhD student out. So it, it was never um, my idea, nor am I the one who's actively publishing it, going through all the steps. But one of the um, PhD students I work with, since I go to their meetings, um, he, I think for a solid two months, if all they talked about is how they need to resubmit the paper for review because this very minor detail wasn't descriptive enough or it was too vague. And everyone in the room ex knows exactly what's, um, what's going on and kind of goes, kind of gets angry because of course this makes sense, but then you have to modify only a little so that whoever is reviewing gets, uh, gets happy and it's just a lot of back and forth of that so i i can definitely understand that the writing is the most tedious part okay uh, i hope that uh provides some insight for everyone as to uh, how research is conducted um sounds kind of frustrating <laughs> but uh, ultimately very rewarding i'm sure um, this is going to be our last question uh, for this section, and then we're going to uh, do our question handoff uh, for the next podcast. Um, so the, our last question is, uh, what is your favorite course you have taught or TA'd?
Uh, I probably have two. One from U of T, one from Waterloo. Uh, I just TA'd the uh, capstone at Waterloo, which is really cool, because um, no shade on U uh, UTM, but our capstone is very short, and it's like four months. Their capstone is like a long two years, and they have to have like a full user base by the end of it if it's like an app and stuff. Um, so like I only got to work with them for one term, but it was really cool to see some of these like projects that like they actually want to get out into the world and like actually do stuff. Um, my favorite one at UTM was probably 258 because uh, working with the the DE2 boards are really fun. I think my favorite course that I have TA'd so far is 209, um, which I think a lot of people would kind of hate me for saying it just because of how infamous uh, 209 is. But I really enjoyed the course, and I guess kind of TAing a course that you enjoyed kind of makes it also enjoyable to TA uh, because you're essentially talking about things, things that you like. Um, because of that, I am looking forward to also TAing 367 and 469, which is um, parallel programming and advanced operating systems. Oh, uh, which I'll be TAing this fall, but I haven't done that yet. So I guess my answer is 209 for now. Of course, the TA would probably have to be 263. And it's also one of those courses that people hear are, is, is hard and whatnot, has so many proofs. But I think it's like the first moment, one of the first moments in secondary CS where you're like, wow, computer science is not just programming. It's like this, all of this data structures and logic and wow, I can make algorithms more efficient and runtime and stuff. So just to kind of see that light bulb go on in people's minds and be like, wow, I can prove that this code works. Like I, I found that so mind blowing when I could prove recursion using induction and that sort of parallel between like what we did in Math 102, and now it's like being applied in CS was really mind blowing. So I really enjoyed that course to TA. So uh, I'll give two answers to this because one's not a real answer. Um, I'm really, really excited for the, in the fall, I'm teaching um, CSC 398, which is an uh, ethics for computer science, mathematicians, and uh, statisticians. Um, it's a course that the UTM desperately needs. And uh, I read a whole bunch about it this summer and it's, it is, the material seems to be super cool. Uh, and I think it should just be a fun class. So I'm really excited for that. It's gonna be totally different from like teaching first year math classes, um, which I'm excited for. But this doesn't really count because I haven't uh, taught it yet. So uh, the, the course that I, I have taught that was sort of most dear to me was maybe Math 102 in the fall of 2019. Um, so the most recent fall. Uh, it was the first time I ever coordinated a huge course. So we had like almost a thousand students. And um, I just love, I love intro to proofs. It's a super cool course and teaches people how to like think in a way that's different from what they're used to. And it teaches them a way to like, um, like, like sort through their own thoughts and like make sense of all the like crazy math that's going on. Um, so I love that course as an undergrad and I love teaching it now. It's a very exciting course for me. Awesome. Um, I'm excited to uh, TA courses in the future given uh, what everyone said. Uh, I've only TA'd 148, so uh, we'll, we'll see what uh, happens. And uh, I think everyone in the chat who can't take uh, Mike's course on ethics. Uh, I think you guys definitely should, considering uh, how excited he is for it. Um, so that's about it for us. Um, now we're gonna try to come up with a question for next week's guests, uh, which they're gonna answer at the start of the episode. Um, next week's episode is going to be um, about math, um, the applications of getting a degree in math, and um, I'm not sure if it's confirmed yet, but um, we are hoping to get uh, Professor Parker Glenady on as a guest. So, uh, 
So yeah, uh, so, Mike, uh, think of a question that you want to ask Parker. <laughs> and uh, so P P Parker and I are dear friends. Um, we did our PhD together. Um, so I'm trying to think of a question that uh, he would like to answer and wouldn't put him too much on the spot. Uh, so I, I think uh, one of the so so Parker and I both juggle quite a bit, um, and I. My question to him is, uh, what is it about juggling that gets him so excited? And how is it related to math other than site swap? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, excited to see what he says to that. I also juggle, but uh, I haven't learned any tricks yet. So <laughs> just a standard three, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, as for our uh, grad student guests, uh, what uh, question do you guys want to pose to the um, student guests that we'll have? They're all going to be in um, their math um, in the math program. Blanked. I have no questions. What do you What do you say to people when they? Say I can't math. Okay. <laughs> I think I've always wondered that because everyone can math. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay. Um, so that's about it for the uh, episode. Uh, I'm going to go through the chat now and uh, try to pose these questions that I missed uh, to our guests. Uh, so let's see here. Um, from Oren, she says, uh, concerning internships, uh, what kind of internships would you do as a grad student? There's definitely, so if you're a research student, there's definitely research internships out there. Um, a lot of different companies have like research, research divisions um, and a lot, most of them do have internships. Uh, so that's probably what you want to look at as a research student. Yeah, this one's kind of hard to answer just because of um, how broad of a question it is. Like, the general answer answer will be do an internship in whatever you're interested in. That doesn't help anyone now, does it? Research um, intern at a lab or a company of your interest. Yeah. But I feel like that's really the best answer to the question is like... Yeah do what you want if right if you maybe if you have a specific interest in something uh, you can maybe talk to a prof or someone else to see what kind of company might be best suited for you but generally speaking yeah whatever seems most interesting to you would be the internship that you want to get into yeah and keep in mind a lot of profs do have either affiliations or know people at uh, pe places that provide internships. So it's definitely worth talking to them if you're not sure. Right. OK, um, next question from Philofi. Uh, he says, I was looking into this the other day, and apparently different journals have very different styles you have to adapt to. How hard is it to match those styles? And is there a personal guideline to get started writing more professionally in academics. Learn LaTeX. That's that's how you adapt to different uh, layouts. Yeah, LaTeX is is the way to go. You know, you go. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, you go into a uh, three sixty. Uh, I mean, two thirty six, and go. Oh man, why why are we using LaTeX? This is so useless. At the end of your undergrad, you're gonna be glad that you learned it, especially if you're going into grad school. Yeah, almost all the uh, paper formats have templates in LaTeX, and like only templates in LaTeX. Yeah, and for some, uh, so so you hear humanities people um, talk, spending a lot of energy on like, oh man, I have to get this formatting for this bibliography correct. I got to do it in this style, and I got to put this period here and this like colon here. No, in LaTeX, it's as simple as like slash title title slash author blam, like. 
and then you you just don't that's all you have to do you just put in the style that they give you and most of it gets formatted for you okay so uh definitely pick up latex uh flow fi uh make sure you know that pretty well um this is a question from mike from orange once again does mike support the robot revolution oh uh this is a good question um i guess uh Yes, but it depends on who uh, is benefiting from it. I mean, that's the big question, right? So uh, we've had like robot revolutions since, uh, like I don't know, since the industrial revolution. Um, the que- and the question just becomes like who benefits from it and how much. Is that uh, something that you would explore in your uh, ethics course? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So excited about this ethics course. I wish it was there when we were at UTM. That would have been my favorite course. Yeah, it totally sounds like the type of work you're doing has like 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 threads inside of it. And um, I think you would find a lot of connections with the work you're doing. Yeah, I think it's some something that's also gone through my mind during undergrad when like I remember a friend of mine was applying to Amazon. Like I'm just saying that for example, and um and then we heard news about them and like factory workers at amazon and stuff like that and they were just like well i don't care i'm getting paid and i was like yeah that that's true but um do do cs people have and have a responsibility towards ethics or not and are they just coding and programming and they don't care where that code gets applied so great questions Okay. Um, Thanks, everyone in the chat for asking your uh, awesome questions. I hope that that provides some answers. Uh, And with that, uh, the fifth episode of the podcast is uh, concluded. So I hope that everyone was able to learn a lot from our guests and their uh, awesome experiences. And uh, hopefully, whether if you're on the fence about going to grad school, you have some more guidance as to uh, that. So uh, I just want to say thank you to uh, all of the guests for being out, coming out here and providing uh, their experiences and insights. And thank you to uh, everyone who helped uh, plan the podcast, uh, such as Orange, Nas, John. Um, is there anything that you guys want to shout out at the end? <laughs> just want to say thanks. This is, this is really fun um, and glad to see some people I know again. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was nice. Yeah. Yeah. Also, CSU two hundred nine is a great course. That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's an objective fact. <laughs> that's the last sentence of this podcast. <laughs> right. That's how we conclude. <laughs> okay. Sorry. One last thing from Ken. He's begging me to ask this. Uh, Mike, do you remember me? I took your course three times in the fall. You never picked me to answer the questions in class. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I remember you. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's possible that your answers were too good, and I wanted the weaker students to have a chance to answer. And your answers would have been too smooth, too clear. I needed them to like think a little bit harder. Okay, there you go, Ken. <laughs> All right. Uh, Thank you so much to uh, all the guests this week. And um, hopefully uh, everyone will tune in next week for our episode on uh, math and uh, what you can do with a math degree with uh, hopefully Professor uh, Parker Glenady. So, yeah, uh, that concludes this episode. Thanks, everyone, for watching. 